This is a war against the West, there's no question. They hate our values. Islamists hate Western values. They hate liberals. They hate democracy. They hate everything that that means. Equality of gender, opportunity, freedom of speech, everything about our lives. It's written in their charter. And the motto of the Houthis is literally, God is great, death to America, death to Israel, curse the Jews. Death. It's like, so it's a really abbreviated version of Mein Kampf. This is a Visegrad 24 series about the Israel-Hamas war. My name is Stefan Thompson. And I'm here with another interview for Visegrad 24. We're on the ground in Israel, in Tel Aviv, meeting with Israelis and meeting with the Jewish diaspora who's gathered here to show support for the country. We're meeting with influencers, journalists, writers, politicians, intellectuals. And we're meeting today with Vivian Berkovich, who's a, a writer, a journalist, a, an activist, and the former ambassador of Canada to Israel. Vivian, lovely to have you. So nice to be here. I was actually kind of on the edge of my seat, wondering as you did your intro, which category you were going to put me in, but well done. The first question I really have for you is, is one about Canada, which has become a bastion of, of left-wing values and ideals, and which interestingly has decided to side, uh, much of Canadian society seems to have sided with Hamas in Palestine. We've seen incredible protests. We've seen incredible scenes of police officers bringing uh, tea and coffee from Starbucks to protesters. Actually, blocking... Tim, Hose, Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons, my apologies. Um, bringing tea and coffee from Tim Hortons to uh, protesters blocking Jewish neighborhoods. C can you tell us what it, what it feels like to be a Jew in Canada today? Terrifying. Um, I was actually, I live uh, in Tel Aviv most of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and I go home for my annual sort of summer break because I can't survive here in the summer heat. And I was supposed to return on October 11th. And then when the war broke out, I ended up staying two months longer. So I got very involved in the local community, which is, as you're probably aware, the fourth largest um, in the world sure. and fourth largest Jewish community. And um, even in October, November, when I was there, things were very, very tense, very distressing, and Jews were fearful and it's only become worse. Um, you know, the, the demonstrations, protests, whatever you want to call them, that are taking place throughout the Western world, um, they're, I call them pro-Hamas and pro-Houthi because that is what they are. They are sometimes called pro-Palestine. But what we've seen in Canada since October 7th is that these protests have not only become more intense, more aggressive, more violent, um, they have more overtly targeted Jews, not Israel. They target Jewish businesses and they've been vandalized. They target Jewish schools. They've had Molotov cocktails thrown in them and multiple uh, bomb threats. They, including they kindergartens. They have been physical Molotov cocktails yes. thrown in Canada at Jewish schools. In Montreal, there were two incidents, same school, correct. Synagogues. Um, but I don't know how many bomb threats. I'm not, you know with sure. the police, but I know there have been many because I hear about these. Um, and, you know, the latest thing has been um, a Jewish, predominantly Jewish neighborhood in the north end of Toronto, quite affluent neighborhood. And there is an overpass um, that leads to the biggest highway in Canada. And that's kind of how people get in and out of their neighborhood. Um, and for probably the last month, it has become a, just this constant demonstration. The demonstrators are the usual, you know, masks and kafias and from the river to the sea and saying all sorts of other things that, in my view, are deeply anti-Semitic and are violent. And um, there's been no enforcement response, nothing. And in Canada, you know, because it's a really big country and there are lots of different levels of government. So Politicians love to make lots of noise about, oh, it's my jurisdiction, that's no jurisdiction. Yeah. And I say, you know, on, online, because I'm pretty active on Twitter, you know, it's all a load of hooey. This is a national crisis because of the violence, because of the widespread hatred. This is not about, you know, municipal jurisdiction. They should be writing municipal tickets. For, like, that's how it's been treated. But the biggest problem of all, the biggest and overarching problem 
is that our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has from the very beginning made it clear where his sympathies lie and they do not lie with Israel. Uh, why is that? Why, why do you think his sympathies do not lie with his, the Israelis or the Israeli state? Well, I mean, I'll be, I'll be kind. Some viewers may think it unkind, but um, I don't think Justin Trudeau has a very sophisticated or well-developed understanding of foreign policy and geopolitics, okay? He's a limited person in terms of, you know, scope of thought. Justin Trudeau is a celebrity. He was elected because he was cute. He went on magazine covers. And I mean, his seriously deficient capabilities in terms of, you know, understanding and thinking about policy, we've seen that for eight years. He famously said inside, I don't know how public this is, but he told the Privy Council office, which is like, you know, the top public servants in the land, um, that he doesn't take written briefings. Okay, which is so before that, you got Prime Minister Harper, who was like a total intellectual kind of sure. wonk, sure. and all he wanted were written, and Justin's like, just talk to me, keep it simple. Okay. So why is he of, of this cloth? Why is he so inclined? I mean, there are a number of different, you know, ways to, to skin this cat, peel the onion, love bad metaphors. Um, I think that one of the simplest and most straightforward is he just wants to be loved, okay? Mm -hmm. And he came in, um, his foreign policy and his domestic policy was very puerile, very simplistic. Um, didn't matter for the first few years so much, not much was going on in the world. His caucus, his liberal caucus um, has a very large number of Muslims mm -hmm. and many of them are what I would consider to be extreme in their views. He also has a... Where, where are these Muslims from? Where, where are these, are these migrants? Is a first generation, second generation migrants what? Uh, I think some of them may be second generation. Most of them are first. Mm -hmm. And where are they from? What, what countries are they broadly, broadly? So we have a large Somali Canadian population. Yeah. One of his top cabinet ministers um, is from uh, Somalia. Sure. Most of them, though, are Pakistani, um, kind of Saudi, Syrian... Lebanon. I mean, we got it all, you know, we really do in Canada. Um, I think most recently, most recent years, you're obviously going to have a preponderance of, um, of Syrians. And of course, um, he famously, you know, announced last week that we, Canada, are going to take in an initial group of refugees, asylum seekers, whatever you want to call them, from the Gaza Strip under our family reunification program. And then several days later, his minister of immigration, an old buddy of his, you know, he was in his wedding party, um, Mark Miller uh, announced that there will be no ceiling to the numbers we will bring in. So people in Canada are, are pretty freaked out about that for a whole bunch of reasons. What was your response after October 7th? How, how does it feel as, as a Canadian Jew as, as someone who, who, who was a, a top diplomat for, for, for the Canadian authorities, to, to suddenly find yourself in this reality where you, you find yourself in a, in a hostile environment, were you surprised? And was the Jewish community surprised to find itself suddenly having its overpass blocked? Is that, did that come as a, did that come out of nowhere? Or was that something that you were aware of over the years that right. there was an issue? So first of all, I mean, thank you for calling me a top diplomat. I, <laughs> um, I was actually a lawyer for 25 years and was what we call a political appointee. So when Prime Minister Harper kind of frankly got fed up with the types of people who the department was recommending to serve in Israel, who generally made it clear that they loathe this country, he said, I'm going outside. I want to find somebody who'll actually, you know, represent my policy. And I'm, I'm the elected official after all. But I appreciate that. And so... In terms of surprise factor, I was not surprised at all to see, you know, that there is anti-Semitism in Canada. Mm. It, I've always seen it. It's always been there. Um, institutional kind of residual entrenched institutional anti-Semitism is very, very strong. For example, um, within the ranks of the Foreign Service in Ottawa. Mm. It's known in Ottawa. I experienced it directly. And it's very, very deeply ingrained, very much like what the UK Foreign Office might have been like, you know, in the 50s and the 60s. Mm. Um, ours hasn't changed in terms of character much. And there are many other institutions. I'll just give that as one example. Banks, legal culture has historically been that way. I mean, Canada is a European country more than an American. 
It's a country now of 40 million people. There are 375,000 Jews, so they say. That number has been static for about 40 years, I think. Um, there are 2 million Muslims, so they say. And if you look at the trajectory of Muslim population based on immigration and birth rate of those who are already in the country, Canada is on track by 2030 to have the highest percentage of Muslim population of any country in the world other than Ireland. Wow. Yeah, I was just looking at those stats last week. We're higher, we're on but, track to be higher even than Germany. Is in six years. Yes, I know. And we're bringing in, if they, if they do what they say they're going to do, we're going to be bringing in lots more. And no one has actually thought through the policy implications, um, the social harmony or lack thereof, if and how they adjust. Those are all kind of, I guess we'll get to those later. Um, but back to your question, which was, was I surprised? No. What did surprise me, though, was the virulence, uh. the ferociousness, um, and how quickly it just spread. You know, and that to me wasn't just Muslim anti-Semitism. That was a real kind of um, combustion moment, like convergence of Muslim anti-Semitism and the, I don't call them progressive left because there's nothing progressive about them, but the kind of, you know, the woke, the wokesters, right? And what Justin Trudeau has done since October 7th when they get out there and do their thing is he, you know, people get upset and he says, you know, Listen, I mean, I know they're very condescending too. It's like, well, you know, it's tough, I know, but like we are a democracy. We weren't during the trucker convoy, but that's okay. We are a democracy and um, we really have to tolerate freedom of speech and protest. Now, number one, freedom of speech and protest are American terms, not Canadian legal terms, okay? We talk in terms of freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. Mm -hmm. And he said they're peaceful protests and we just have to put up with them. Well, actually, with all due respect, Prime Minister, they're not. Everything about these protests breaches criminal code provisions for inciting hate. There has been vandalism. There have been physical assaults. There have been threats. There have been death threats. I could go on and on and on. These people could and should have been charged 6,000 ways to Sunday. You know, just blocking major streets and doing pop-up mosques. Like, you want to practice your religion? That's great. But there are like hundreds of mosques in Toronto. No other religion is going to block the major downtown business intersection because they want to start a prayer room. And all of these things have just been allowed. And what he's done with his spineless conduct is, number one, signaled, in my view, where his political sympathies lie. But more importantly, he's emboldened this activity. And so now, the last two, three weeks, things have been getting really out of hand. And, and they're clueless. They don't know what to do. They can't take control. The cops even said after they got slammed for delivering, you know, Timmy Ho's, any Canadians out there, it's Timmy Ho's. I know Tim Horton's coffee and um, Uber Eats and, you know, hey, you know, bringing these deliveries and stuff up to the guys who are the kafia guys and the masks. And um, the cops then came under a lot of fire and the Toronto, the chief cop for Toronto said, okay, we're going to, we're going to start, a, don't you block that. We're going to start arresting and we're going to get really tough. Well, guess what? Yesterday, all over again, the same thing. They didn't do anything. So, you know, it's, 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 and the, the, the threats are, there are much more serious threats and the conduct is mm. stepping up. But th there's this unholy alliance between the the far left and and radical Muslims in in the West that is a very strange alliance because many of the values held by radical Islam are not shared by those on the radical left, a and yet here we are with with the, these two groups, these two very sort of separate groups having the strategic alliance around the Israeli issue and around essentially uniting over their one core point, anti-Semitism. But, but there is a, a, a strangeness to the, the far left becoming anti-Semitic. Why, why do you think that when, when Jews over several decades in the West have been oftentimes associated to 
um, left-wing social causes, having been very strongly involved in civil rights in the United States of America and for social justice and in, in, the, in the classic understanding of, this, of the sense rather than this, this new term of social justice. Why, why do you think that, that the left has abandoned Jews and, and, and maybe even betrayed them? Well, we've, we've seen that we've been to this rodeo before, right? I mean, we saw this kind of in the 60s with the civil rights movement. And um, I, I don't, I would t kind of take exception to the suggestion that the West or the progressive left, such as it was, ever actually embraced any Jewish presence, authority, influence. Um, I think that what it comes down to, if, if I take their ideology seriously today, um, and it's all about CRT, critical race theory. And critical race theory, you know, it's everything's binary. You're an oppressor, you're a colonizer, you're, um, let's see, what are, oh, you're white and male or female. I think those are the kind of main categories. Yeah, so you're either oppressed or oppressor. Yeah, well, yeah, what else? Cis. I just learned what that was like two days ago. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, you're, you're on one or the other side of the line, right? Sure. And But Jews, of course, in their view, are the ultimate. We are the apex of the oppression period, pyramid. They've decided we're all white. We're not. We're actually not even a biological race. That was Hitler's great innovation, was to develop this biological racial theory of what is a Jew. Mm. You know, measuring skulls and noses and all that. I and mean, it's just complete malarkey. Um, so... Jews are not a race, we don't fit their paradigm, but they've made us fit it, and they've decided that. Um, I just think that they need, um, they need someone to vilify, and we're always a really convenient target. And that's the question I throw back at you into the universe. Like, I don't know. My kids used to ask me when they were little, mommy, why do they all hate us? Ask them. But what I can say in this moment, is that they, based on the criteria that the woke left has applied and developed, Jews are the greatest evil, right? And so that meshes perfectly with this, um, the pro-Hamas, pro-Houthi, um, you know, marches, demonstrators in the West, because they all hate Israel. So, you know, let's have a big, big love hug on that. I mean, I see constantly online people talking about, oh, I'm going over in Palestine, you know, solidarity with the Palestinians, and they go on like an eating tour of the West Bank or, you know, so, whatever. Um, I'm, I'm always offering on Twitter to drive them to the border with Gaza. I always say, I'll, I'll send you off with a sandwich and a bottle of water, and I'll point you in the right direction. Go embrace your Hamas brothers and sisters. And don't forget to take your Queers for Palestine flag. Sure, I was going, those was going to right? say and see how they embrace you. I cannot explain their willful blindness to what it is they are embracing and endorsing and empowering. It's insanity. How much do you think of this is actual genuine anti-Semitism versus being misinformed by the PR machine of the axis of Iran, Russia, China, that is linked to Hamas. How much of these college students actually sort of chanting from the river to the sea and Yemen, and Yemen make us proud, turn another ship around. How much of that is real anti-Semitism and how much of that is just absolute ignorance? Um, and, and also just this, this being influenced by TikTok psyops. How, how much do you, do you think of it as genuine anti-Semitism? So I have no like legit accurate way of actually answering that there question. There probably is it. It's more of an intuition yeah, no, first. But yeah, but I so think I'm curious to know totally, what your intuition is. Totally. I just want to make that clear. Yeah. Um, but my gut is, I think probably a lot of them are really ignorant. You know, we both, I'm sure, see stuff online every day. I saw one just today when I was coming over of some kid in his 20s demonstrating and he said hey you look i just got this sign and is person... it the intifada one was it the yeah. one that he asked yeah. what is it was a socialist intifada yeah and the, it was constant and kissing goes what's an intifada exactly yes. and, and he goes i just got this sign i'm sorry i'm not really sure what it means right yeah. and so i think there's a I, th I do i think there's a lot of that yeah. i think there's a tremendous amount of ignorance in the yeah. west apathy laziness there's so many things going on, but as a Jewish person, I don't really have the luxury to study it in that way. I see. I feel that 
I'm the daughter of a, of a Holocaust survivor. Mm. It's really quite ingrained in my DNA. And I, I smell trouble mm. and I see trouble. Um, and I don't feel that I have the luxury of time to figure it all out. Do you so smell 1930s trouble? 1930s Germany, you know, yeah. it didn't happen overnight. Mm. It really is little stops along the continuum. And then you realize, holy crap, look what we've become. Do you smell trouble just for Jews and Israel, or is this a broader danger to the West? Oh, it's way much broader. Mm. There's no question. I mean, we're just easy pickings. Mm. The Jews are, we know it. It's just a thing. Jews are always the canaries in the coal mine. We're always the first. I mean, isolating and attacking and vilifying Israel mm. is fun for lots of people, it seems. I mean, the absurdity of the, of the way in which this International Court of Justice fracas is shaping up. Israel, of all the countries in the world, and in this moment, is being hauled off to the International Court of Justice and accused of genocide. It's sheer insanity. It's an inversion of everything that matters, of common sense, of rational thinking, of morality. And I just think that Jews are easy. We're easy there too, you know, people like, Oh, look at all the Jews, you know, you're all rich. Well, no, we're not all rich. And, you know, you're when you're privileged, privileged. My dad came off the boat in the 50s with like nothing. Mm. He'd been bashed around, you know, for uh, good and hard. Privileged? We worked really hard. I think, though, this particular iteration, as it's shaping up, of anti-Semitism, um, just as was Nazism, Nazism focused initially on Jews, but they had lots of others in their sights, sure. right? It wasn't just the Jews. They had others. Take care of the Jews first. This is, a, this is a war against the West. There's no question. They hate our values. Islamists, the Islamists hate Western values. They hate liberals. They hate democracy. They hate everything that that means. Equality of gender, opportunity, freedom of speech, um, everything about our lives. And they make no secret. I mean, I not actually a conspiracy theorist. It's written in their charters. Sure. Right? You go read the Houthi charter. You read the Hamas and charter. The motto of the Houthis is literally God is great, death to America, death to Israel, curse the Jews. Exactly. That's literally their motto. Right? It's I mean, uh... it's like so it's a really abbreviated version of Mein Kampf, but it's like I'm inclined to like believe it. I yeah. take it seriously. I I don't really yeah. want to engage in a back and forth with them. And there's this, you know, what was really interesting, just a moment of levity, mm -hmm. if we can. Shortly after, I returned to Israel in early December. And, you know, that's kind of Santa Claus time. And, of course, as a Jewish person, I have major Christmas envy. And so, you know, Santa Claus is always in the malls, right, sure. for Christmas. And the kids go and sit in his lap. And my mother never, ever, ever let me because I think something really bad was going to happen to me. Like if I ate bacon, I'm here to tell you that nothing happened. But when I ate bacon, anyhow. Um... So Santa Claus was in all these malls. Sure. And the demonstrators were there as well. This was in their Zara moment. Remember when they decided? And they were terrifying children. They were screaming at children and at their parents. They were going right up to Santa. Santa. So, so they were going after Christmas. It wasn't that they, they were no longer, that their protest against Israel and the Jews who don't celebrate Christmas had now targeted Christmas as part of their yeah. war against Israel. Well, it's like, yeah, like how can you be, and it was, you know, they would say things like, how can you be celebrating Christmas when Palestinians are being slaughtered by the evil Nazi Jews? Like crazy stuff, okay? But here's the good thing. It, that was when like a lot of people in Canada, like the ones I think you're talking about, who don't really pay attention, sure. who it never really impacts their lives directly. They went crazy over the Santa thing. Mm. And I was like, good. Like, you know, see, this this really is, they're coming for you next. Mm. Um, and, and I think that people started to understand that was when I noticed in Canada, you can certainly see in the media and when I talk to people and on social, it started to shift a little. And now Canadians are going crazy when they talk about bringing in, you know, hundreds of thousands possibly from Gaza. There's like, what, like, what are you on? Do you see what's going on in our streets? Wh why? The systemic problems that we're facing in the West and the general sense of decline of the West. Um, 
according to numerous metrics, be it demographics, where the, there is no replacement levels of, of Western society, which indicates a lack of will to live, uh, the mass migration issues, and the general deterioration of high trust societies into very untrusting societies with a lot of tensions on, on, on multiple lines, on, on economic, cultural, and, and ethnic lines across Western societies. Do you think there's a turning back point from this? Is there a way back? Like a take back the night kind of moment? Sure. I think there could be. I think it will be very ugly. I think that in terms of, you know, when you talk about mass migration and the lack of willingness of our governments, our law enforcement authorities, our courts to sort of step in and manage these issues and provide guidance um, has been astonishing. So I'm not sure how you turn things back. Mm. I think we all Western countries now understand that we have a very large, radicalized, hostile population in our midst. They marched in the streets. And, then, and they made it very clear. There was a very a, an absolute demonstration of strength. To me, when I was watching the images out of London, where I right. grew up, and I saw 300,000 people in Remembrance Sunday, and I haven't seen crowds like that through my entire childhood. This is the 11th of... November was 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 celebrating the victory of and we're remembering all of those who fell fighting Germany in World War One and then World War Two, and to see the streets fill with hundreds of thousands, three hundred thousand people, with flags of a foreign nation, being being waved in our streets was absolutely terrifying, and a heart wrenching moment of pain, of seeing. The people who have, who are guests in our nation, because many of these people were from immigrant backgrounds, have, show no respect for the sacrifices that had been that had been paid in order to have a democratic society in which they have the right to march with those flags. It's it's hard wrenching. It actually hurts physically to, to talk about it and to think about it that way. I... It's a great sense of betrayal of the hospitality and kindness and generosity that the West has has extended to many people across the world. Yeah, and we're fools because we we didn't understand that not all cultures are the same. Mm. Um, you know, I'm sure you saw, I saw that terrible scene of a, a London Bobby, as we used to call them, sure. a London police officer, taking a UK a British flag mm. from someone in the crowd and saying, you can't have that. We've had that in Canada, where they tell people waving Canadian flags, put that down. You're and provoking get out of here. people. Yeah. You're provoking people it's with like, the, the flag of the country that, it, that is the host. It is unbelievable. And, you know, my Canada, more so than the UK, is a country very much built on, on immigrants. And we came, and I know my parents were always, you know, you have to be respectful, you keep your head down, you work hard, you show respect for the dominant culture. That's just the way it was and has been up until very recently. But look, the fact is the cultures um, and the Islamist culture and it's not a fringe i mean you know lots of people like to say oh it's just a fringe no it's not and if there are tons of moderate muslims then why are they all silent sure why are none speaking out not one in canada mm. has spoken out where are they we know in countries like turkey for example correct me if i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure it's something like 40 45 percent of the population in turkey which is the great secular Muslim experiment, is considered to be radicalized, highly radicalized. I haven't seen the data, but I... But I it's some, like, I, I, I remember it falling off my chair. Center. Pure Research Center, the, the data that you see in Pure Research Center is always incredible to see um, because the numbers are, are so staggering. I mean, the numbers, for example, support for, for, for stoning or for honor killings, it's always surprisingly high. You know, but I wanted to ask you, Vivian, yeah, we, we, we were discussing all these issues in the West mm -hmm. and, and suddenly, so, so, so we see these huge structural problems in the West and the argument goes, why should Western countries that are dealing with such huge, profound systemic issues, why should they care about Israel? Why, why should they be helping in any way or getting involved when they can barely deal with their problems at home? What would you respond to? Yeah, that's a good question. I ask myself sometimes too. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the only answer I have is that, um, you know, Israel is, first of all, the only Jewish country in the world. Um, the Jewish religion is agreed to be the crucible of the three Abrahamic faiths. Sure. Um, and in terms of the country and what it has been up until this point, 
It has, for the most part, it's democratic. Um, there is equality, all those good things that we value in the West. But that's nice. Like, that's apple pie, and that's great. But why should the West care, and why will it care, and why will it be drawn into the next war in the region and possibly world war? Because as goes Israel, so goes the West. Just as the Jews in Europe were the canaries in the coal mine for World War II in the famous Evian Conference in 1938, uh, July 1938, when Churchill hosted, you know, I think it was 32 nations and uh, from around the world. And um, there was also the Nazis were there as observers and Golda Meir was there as an observer from Mandatory Palestine. And the topic uh, that they were discussing was, you know, July 38. It was right after the Anschluss in Austria. So the Germans had already invaded Austria and taken it over. And it was like, what the hell are we going to do with all these Jews, you know, in Europe? Um, because, you know, it's kind of getting a little nasty. Now, up until then, the West had been like, ah, they rough up a few Jews. It happens all the time. But as long as they're not like slaughtering them. I mean, there were there were leaders that actually said these things. And I was just writing a paper recently, so I'm a little fresh on this topic. And um, they ended up deciding at Evian, and Churchill said, don't worry, don't worry. Like, you don't have to mess with any of your quotas, which, of course, you know, they had like two Jews a year they allowed. And don't have to mess. We're just going to get together and talk about it. So it was all very, you know, form over substance. And in the end, every single country, they came up with excuses like, yeah, well, you know, we, we, we don't need any more money traders or we don't need any more money changers or like there were all these horrible stereotypically anti-Semitic reasons. The only country that actually stepped up and said they'd take any were, was the Dominican Republic. They said, we're down to take 100,000. They can cultivate some garbage agricultural land. We've got, you know, some God knows where. Um, but what happened because of that was the Nazi observers went back and it was exactly this very, you know, very um, similar situation. The Nazi observers went back and they said to Hitler, no one cares. We can do what we want with the Jews. No one cares. Uh -huh. And they did. And then the world woke up. And so can the world be isolationist again today and sit back and say, I don't really care what happens to Israel. I'm really far away. Okay, you can. Except that these days, I think that the, the timeline is much more compressed. So, you know, the Houthis start, start you know, shooting firecrackers at ships and stuff and the U.S. is already drawn in, well, I, I'm sorry, but y y you can't isolate now the way you did in World War I and World War II because they're going to disrupt shipping. They're going to attack U.S. military bases, commercial interests all over the world, um, you know, corporate interests, buildings, people. I mean, these are Islamists, and it's a death cult, sure. and their credo is spread the word of... Um, Muhammad, and and make the world a global caliphate. I mean, that's what they say, not me. And any violence in that pursuit is justified. So the West can talk about wanting to stay withdrawn, but you know, and I know, because we read about this probably compulsively, both of us, I'm just guessing, that there have been multiple large-scale terror attacks that have been, um, that have been aborted Foiled, correct. Foiled in, in Western Europe over the last few Absolutely. weeks. Absolutely. So, yeah, you can pretend that you're isolated and it's not going to impact you, but it will. I just think, you know, what kind of world do you want to live in? Somebody was saying to me they were recently speaking to a big, you know, corporate group in America and like various, and a friend of mine, he said, you know, I told them that, uh, you no, know, the U.S., you can see it with Trump, with this, with that. They're all going to go isolationist. I said, you're dead wrong. They may want to, but they're not going to be able to. They're not going to be able to. I, that's my view. I think we're, if we're not already, are already in the early stages of a world, a global conflict, we're on the verge. But in it terms feels of... like it. it yeah. There's a sense in the air of, of history has sped up as we've watched. I mean, it's, there's a sense of we've been, uh, we've been sort of sleepwalking for 30 years in the West. Right. The 90s were this blissful period of... Uh, Cocooning. Cocooning. That's a Big nice popcorn. way of putting it. And then suddenly it speeds up. It speeds up. Um, we were walking through the lobby and my, my, my brother pointed to the screen and it was saying that Pakistan had just bombed Iran. And my brother goes, wow, you know, history speeding up. You can feel it. And there is a real sense of that. And there's a tremendous clash of, 
of values and ideologies. And I just don't think that either one is able to sit back and pretend it's not happening. I want to add, I want to end this on a happy note. I, I'd like to ask you what the, what is the proudest thing about Israel for you? What are you proudest of in this country? I am proudest of the fact that it is a completely chaotic, crazy place that somehow really like every day I think this place, it's a freaking miracle <laughs> that anything gets done. Right. And it does. Sure. And and it gets done with such a such a joie de vivre. People live here. Mm. They really do. They just every moment counts. Um, and I love the kind of um, moments in the startup nation, like where something really simple, really simple technologically, and they just won't do it because they're being Israeli with you. No, they just don't feel like it. You know. Yeah. So yeah, but I I. I it's a, it's a place full of life because we never know when it's going to be taken from us. And it's true. And you just live here, man. You squeeze the lemon hard every day. Vivian Berkovich, thank you so much. I'm ready. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate you being our guest.